Tricky Triangles is one of the easiest stars to do. Do you ever use a side somersault? For 100 points in Tall Tall Mountain, it helps you go through the slide from the exit back onto the side. Okay, I think he's dead. This may have been the number one video. There we go. I've never watched that one. This man has never side flipped in his life. You're not locked in to get in a mountain house. This guy sounds like Steve Buscemi's illegitimate son. There comes a time when you simply have to accept that you were dead wrong about a thing you used to love back in the day. It sure doesn't help that I recently got done playing Mario Sunshine now. I've learned a lot about the 64th game in the Mario platformer series since my awful experience from the Wii U Virtual Console emulator, not the least of which is that it's kind of overrated. I don't care for how long you play this game, it's pretty difficult to get comfortable with the way Mario handles here. Plus the incompetent at times camera, plus those notorious instances of uber type platforming, plus whatever the heck else. With all that in mind, at this point I'd rather take Mario's bottomless bum underwater. I haven't really touched on this much at all, but as sluggish as his swimming speed is, it pretty much always takes place in super open areas not exactly besieged by Bowser's water-dwelling minions, which is good. It's not so great when you enter Jolly Roger Bay for the first time and have to wade through a thin dark fog en route to the sunken ship, whose entrance is guarded by our friend Unagi. It's especially not fun hanging right underneath the stubborn eel, waiting for days for it to crawl out of its hidey hole. I've never figured out what I'm supposed to do to get this guy to straight up- Really? At least now that the ship has resurfaced and it's broad daylight out, I shouldn't have to deal with Unagi anymore, right? When the moon hits you, I- SHUT UP! I think that gruesome scene you have to watch when Mario drowns plays a big role in why Can the Eel Come Out to Play is such a frightening task. This time Unagi actually moves out of its new hidey hole, no longer at the bottom of the bay, but instead it drags the power star by its tail and you're supposed to swim towards it to collect- Wait, you mean that doesn't actually collect the star? The eel can really deal a number on you if you're not careful. Get hit just once and you might have to resurface to replenish your power meter, assuming you can make it there of course, but at that point the eel break physics once again and resets itself. Is this a joke? If you've ever been forced to lure Unagi out of the hole again, you know how easy it is to lose your patience. The good thing is that it's the last you'll see that pesky rat in this game. Now if you're a Mario enjoyer, you've probably gone about filling the ex-plumber's pockets with a vast fortune spread over the many courses of his adventures. Well, Super Mario 64 pretty much started that trend, granting shiny rewards for collecting 100 coins. You might remember it was a chore getting everywhere, plus having to deal with the star spawning right above you upon meddling with the milestone money no matter Mario's momentary mess. I'm my. And nowhere have I more often had that struggle than in Tall Tall Mountain. Yes, that one stage on which I received so many comments on my last video. This is probably a good time to regale you on some backstory. I actually played the handheld port of Mario 64 first, and even though it wasn't a dark memory I had from that version, I remembered that going down the slide actually locked you within, so unless there were actually way more coins added in the DS port, you'd eventually have to go down the slide to complete your 100 coin mission there. I didn't think anything of the opening that was originally there 30 years ago. What was I supposed to do, jump out and hope for a gust of wind to blow me back up to the course? You really want me to just throw all my cash away like that? Jerks. Even after we've put an end to all that confusion, it's still too easy for me to fall at any given part of this map. These red coins obviously provide an invaluable boost to the coin total, but they just so happen to sit on the tiniest mushroom platforms in the game. Why do I gotta balance on a rolling log to get across to the more nerve-wracking part of the stage? And why does the monkey have to chase me there and drive up my heart rate? I don't want to lose my hat. I get that I surprised a lot of you when I brought up this lofty challenge six years ago, and you can probably tell me to shut up and get good, but it really comes down to this control scheme is just not easy to get used to. Especially if you spent your whole life playing Mario Galaxy or even three months with Sunshine. I will tell you to get good at Mysterious Mountainside, however. I've heard so many of you complain about how hard it is to get to the star on the lone mushroom pad here. So what if the bob buddy that opens the cannon is hiding way below you? So what if you're supposed to actually teleport there by the tiniest mushroom platform? And so what if you only get one shot and risk dying if you miss? If you know where to look, take your time, and aim your shot at this precise point, it's not really that painful. Not to mention there are plenty other ways to reach that star, from bouncing off a fly guy to long jumping off the tip top of the mountain. It's really flexible in that regard, unlike in the Rainbow Ride, where the airborne cruise ship is just hanging out for no good reason. It's a painstaking climb up to the cruiser, because the long string of magic carpets take their sweet time up these rainbow paths, and even at the tip top of the rainbow boarding the airship is an actual nightmare. I mean, if you've mastered Mario 64 controls, it's not nearly as terrible, and at least the star is in plain sight when you get there. <laughs> yeah, no it's not. The one I'm talking about actually does require a cannon blast to reach it, but of course the cannon is blocked off on your first trip here, and the way to open it is on the complete opposite end of the stage. It's a good thing you can talk to the bob buddy once and forget about it afterwards. And you can grab an unrelated star while you're at it. Anyway, you've probably made that brave magic carpet voyage once already, but then been forced to settle for the booby prize on the cruiser bow. Where have I seen that before? 
Where have I seen that before? I really don't understand this set of hovering platforms at the end of the rainbow. I mean, at this point, I feel more comfortable jumping off the pole to reach it. Never mind the massive windstorm that assaults you once you reach the ship. The big test is being able to reach the island way off the map. Now, where have I seen that before? Like with the mysterious mountainside, you pretty much get one chance with the cannon. And like with the mysterious mountainside, the worst part of the mission is behind you at this point. You can always look up the exact angle to shoot before launching, but if not, look at this circular rainbow. That's really all you need to do it correctly. Shut up and get good. Now I'm sure somewhere over the rainbow is one of those levels that nobody looks forward to playing, which is very reasonable, given that the whole map is perched precariously over a giant death pit. I was able to keep a level ahead playing the rainbow ride on account of its notorious difficulty spike, but by huge contrast, me thinks Tiny Huge Island is out to get me or something. It might be the one stage in 64 that I've played the least, because I'm always asking myself how I've managed to complete it 100% before. And I'm kind of kicking myself for not talking about it last time around. It's a straightforward gimmick. Tiny Huge exists in two separate dimensions that determine the size of the world around you, but thankfully there are pipes litter around which you can use to change that hugely overrated setting. Your most painful task while traversing these unsettling worlds? Why, of course, collecting 100 coins. Incidentally enough, if I didn't have to worry about this map being tiny or huge, I'm pretty sure I'd have no problems getting the star. It's a double-edged sword whichever route you take. Either you're sometimes too big to traverse this little batch of platforms that might decide to blow you off just because, and why is this a death pit to begin with, or it's an absolute chore to get anywhere in this huge pond, and seriously, which is it? Is it an island at sea or one that floats? Do I gotta find the Master Emerald now, or did Eggman steal it already? You can yell at me about how Tiny Huge Island has by far the most coins to collect out of any of the main courses in this game, and how reaching that total should be a total cakewalk on paper, but there are just way too many parts of this map that give me reservations. This whole tiny dimension is littered with mini Goombas that are easy to miss, and if they do hit you, you get momentarily stunned in place and risk falling for a while. It took me a minute, but I managed to cannon blast up to this log post on the Lonely Island, only to find out it's just a decoy. Guess I should have read the signpost. Then I later found out it does give coins after all, but only after you run in and out of the cave with the red coins. Speaking of, why would anybody consider to collect this cluster of crimson currencies when a not correct calculation will cause them to careen into the carbon chasm? Come on! You know, I take that back. This cave does hold a pair of blue coins, but look at that, they're guarded by our old pal Kuromami. Good to see you again, buddy. What about Wiggler's stomping grounds just above that madness? Yeah, you can find 10 coins there, but if you hop in with like 85, you will have a bad time. I can tell a few of you out there had that same dread for Tiny Huge Island. It kind of takes me back to the days of shamelessly using action repay on the DS port to minimize the pain. At least there exist some strategies here, such as staying out of the tiny dimension at all costs and ground pounding the giant Goombas for 5 coins instead of 1 because reasons. GG's Nintendo. Of course, I don't really have that luxury when spelunking in the hazy maze came for its 100 coin star. Seeing that this one gave a bunch of you fits was kind of a surprise. It's only the 6th main stage out of 15, it's an area I pretty much know inside and out from all my years playing the handheld version where I'm almost positive I never had any issues, so what could have gone wrong here? Oh look, a largely limited lot of liquidity laid out in the level. Lovely. I guess it doesn't help that Hazy Maze Cave is probably the largest map in the game, requiring a good deal of patience as you trudge across four stories with the slow-going elevators. This undertaking will take you literally everywhere, because there just aren't enough coins to comfortably skip one of the more difficult areas like you might have seen in Watch for Rolling Rocks, Navigating the Toxic Maze, and of course, Elevate for 8 Red Coins. Speaking of, I can't remember what else there was to do in the elevator room besides the red coins. I'm just saying, it looks awfully large to only house one objective. You got a couple of spinning eyes that are worth a blue coin each, but their platforms are tiny, and screwing it up means getting hit plus fall damage, so it's honestly not worth it. I thought the elevators traveled at a snail's pace, but Mario clinging underneath the railings is awful in this game, and it actually makes me want to boot up Sunshine instead. Too bad it's not summer yet. Does anyone else get paranoid that the game's gonna go rogue and fail to register that I'm holding the A button here, or is that just me? And what about the hazy maze itself? Thank the lord it doesn't stun Mario every two seconds, right? Well, this is where all the blue coins are. No pressure at all. This is just a very stressful task to take on, especially given the jank controls you have to work with. But wait a minute, I'm only halfway through this list, so you know I've got way more of these stages to be nerve-wracked about, like that cloud stage. Actually, I'm not gonna bother with this one. You know the drill by now, 8 red coins, wing Mario, cloud hopping, cannon blast, falling back outside Peach's terrifying residence, blah 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 blah. Here's the deal. I really think this platforming challenge tops out at number 5 for a variety of reasons. It's much shorter than everything else I've touched on, there are plenty of easy one-ups scattered around the course, yeah you risk getting pushed to the furthest point away from the stage, but at least it doesn't take your lives away too, and if we're being blunt here, the wing cap is probably easier to control for me than standard Mario. Seriously, I bet I could make one of those if I fail this stage the video ends challenges and have it last for 2 hours. Remember when I was hesitant to try my luck here? 6 years feels like an eternity. 
Anyway, now that I've asserted my dominance over the wing cap, I should trek back down to the basement for number 4, specifically the desert world that nobody likes. You might recall that I used to struggle with the red coin mission in Shifting Sandland from having to fly and cannon across the map for the Scarlet Monies. But look at Nathaniel B's kryptonite over here. That would be like a free flying for 8 red coins at a can or two of Red Bulls, so all I can really say about the Desert Flight Show is thank goodness you don't have to go into the pyramid to complete it. I think it's really cool that there are whole other worlds hidden in places you wouldn't think to look at first, but the world within the pyramid gets a little ridiculous with what I'm expected to do in terms of pure platforming. This whole climb up to the top of the pyramid makes me think back to the magic carpet rides from before, but made a lot easier to miss time a jump and fall thanks to having an incompetent camera like a two following you upwards. Now thankfully there's no death pit to worry about unless you get too close to these sinkholes, but if you do fall, it almost certainly does a number on your patience level once again. It's kind of painful not being able to traverse the pyramidal interior at peak speed because I'm getting stopped by all the hazards and the inconsistent platform placements. At least the star is free for you to take once you finally reach the top. You still haven't learned your lesson, have you? You may have noticed this game has a massive thing for hiding rewards in the most cryptic spots. Who would ever have launched themselves straight at the wall? I don't have time to turn backwards right out of the gate for this first red coin, I gotta find Bowser. Then he had the nerve to do it again right before the final showdown! Jeez! But the Pyramid Puzzle Star in Shifting Sandland is far and away the worst offender here. Once you've figured out that you're supposed to nab 5 secret coins to make the star appear, the nightmare only begins when you're just trying to jump from one tiny floating prism down to the next. There are 3 of them all together, and they're all on the same horizontal plane, but actually getting there is frustrating because the camera guy just doesn't want to stay still here. I've been able to make use of both the Lakitu and Mario camps to make my playthrough a little more bearable, like in Big Boo's balcony for example, but neither one is ideal in this case due to its incredulous instability. I really wish it behaved more like in the Bowser stages or the Rainbow Ride. They got the camera right, so why not this one? We're in a pyramid after all. I don't get it. As you might have guessed, this is another one of those deceptive missions that I had kind of suppressed in the back of my mind since it was probably so much less painful to deal with on the DS. I can tell you though that the three remaining stars are almost certainly the same level of reduced challenge for a handheld accessibility, but in the case of the 64th Mario game, if you've heard it once, you've heard it at least 500 times. Stomp on the thwomp. Nope! You're familiar with the stage in the latter half of the game that plays like the inside of a grandfather clock, right? To properly describe the level of platforming challenge throughout this map, it would be like if the pyramid puzzle chugged a 15 hour energy. I mean, yeah, you can control the speed of the clock skiers, but it really doesn't matter. The idea is to get from here to way, 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 way up there. If it was the other way around, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Tilting cubes, narrow walkways, rotating plates, and of course, spinning clock hands. What more could you want? If you have the clockworks frozen, there's a point that kind of looks like you're at a dead end, and the way to advance the level is to get real creative with Mario's moveset, I didn't realize we were playing Kaizo, and the Thwomp of Destiny awaits way up top where you're supposed to ride this moving hand to the other side, so obviously it helps to have the clockworks moving in that regard as well. But then that creates the problem of all these moving platforms, as tiny as they were to begin with, so for a guy like me who still struggles controlling Mario in this game, every move suddenly becomes 10 times harder. So naturally, since I somewhat doubt my ability with the game still, I kinda wanna stop time. But now I'm left with a problem, if the world is frozen in time, this hand won't move and now I can't claim my winnings. Did I just get scammed? Well, no. If you go off to the side here, you're right below the thwomp and you can actually get up to its level with a well-placed triple jump and wall kick combination. Shout out to Nathaniel B for pointing that out. Alright, good times are had by all, we completed an arduous journey and can now breeze through the remaining stars in TikTok clock. Except of course not. I get it if you just want to worry about getting to your heavenly thwomper, but 100 coins. Yes, all in the clock tower. It's a main stage like the rest of them, don't kid yourself. All those tricky jumps and well-timed stunts, and you have to worry about maintaining your coin count as well. This time you're going to want to stop the clock so you can get those red coins too. Or maybe you can skip them, I don't know. There is one part near the top where it felt like I had to make a leap of faith to grab the coins there because I didn't trust the randomly spinning gears to straighten out. There are 128 coins in here, so not a whole lot of room for error, but you better grab all those blue coins, and I'm sure glad they don't stop and ask you to save your game upon touching them. I don't need any horrible flashbacks. Funny I should say that when me thinks a lot of you get nightmares from cloud hopping for 5 years, solving THE most obscure puzzle in video game history, and especially scaling this forsaken clock. Here's the deal though, Super Mario 64 doesn't have one of those obvious super player stages, so at the end of the day, determining THE hardest star to collect here all comes down to... <laughs> yeah, that. I mean, what else is there to say about Rainbow Ride's 100 coin star? I guess you could say it's a little more generous with the total number of coins available, but that's only if you're an expert wall kicker. 
You can still get your 100 without the blue coins, but you'll have to explore literally every corner of the Sky World and not fall. Even with the blue coins, no other part of the map is very helpful to your coin collectathon, and really, no point in Rainbow Ride is particularly easy to traverse either. On top of everything else, this is the one star that took me about an hour to finish playing it for this top 10. No thanks to me dying over and over attempting this jump off the Tricky Triangles platform, oh the irony. I can't stop trying to side somersault out of nothing because I'm so used to pulling it off in Mario Sunshine. Talk about dissatisfying. Did I mention how draining it is relying solely on lateral displacement? At least in Tick Tock Clock, you could easily kill the previous two stones with one bird since they're both similarly long uphill battles. There is no such cheat code to be found in the Rainbow Ride. It's the perfect combination of mind-bending platforming challenge, mind-numbing test of your patience, and near-infinite death trap all over. And that's why it could only be number one. Now if you'll excuse me, I'ma go visit with Nathaniel B. I hear he hangs out in that big house in the sky. Here we go! If you made it this far into the video, go into the comments and tell me what you think of the new Princess Peach game. Personally, I'll be seeing a different showtime at Target Field next week, but after you've done that, feel free to do the usual things. You know, rate it even if you hate it, pass me around and tell your kids I'm Steve Buscemi Jr., tell me what I got wrong this time, add me to your subscription and notification feeds, buy me a Pepsi, see if YouTube wants to fire me again. I really should revisit Super Princess Peach instead at some point. I have way too many thoughts written down about that game, I can already tell that video would be at least an hour long and I'm rambling again. Later! And in case you haven't noticed, all my April Fool's videos going forward are rated PG, just because. I hope you're not disappointed in me.